Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the Equal Opportunity Astronomy Podcast, where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the guests are brainy. Ooh, just like true, us. True fact. We are Strange Charm atop the Astro Quarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Addy Dove, and Jim Cooney. Coming to you from physically, but not socially, distanced locations near the University of Central Florida, remember to check out our website to see how to get our snazzy shirts and subscribe to us on all platforms, including YouTube, where you'll be dazzled by our brilliant smiles. Our stumpers today, Jim and Addie, are impossible. Oh, no. Uh-oh. They're already they're just, difficult. <laughs> well, they're not. I mean, you'll be able to make a choice, but you won't be able to do them. So they're, um, they're space, space exploration, space travel all related. Okay. okay. So Addy, your choices, this is in the, in the vein of you have to do one of these two things. Okay. Okay. Suspended animation. So like hypersleep in the science fiction sense, you go to sleep okay. for a relativistic journey for Fifth a element solo. Style? Sorry. I Fifth don't know. element Fifth. style. Forever war style or uh, aliens style. Okay. Okay. Suspended animation for a solo trip to another planet for a year. So you visit the other planet for a year, but returning a thousand years later for when you come back, a thousand years have passed. I see. Because so it's of like Einstein. A, like 499 and a half years there, one year there, and 499 and a half all back. the way back. But for you, it's just... Half. For you, it's just like a year and a half or something. Okay. Uh, or a colony trip, big spaceship colony ship uh-huh. with every any person you want to take with you. You get okay. to choose who goes on that colony ship. So it could also third, be alone. <laughs> it could also be alone. It could I'd be very interested if that's your choice. Uh, anyone, everyone or no one of your choosing, as you see fit for a 30-year one-way trip to another planet. And then we're on that planet at the end. And then you're, you move, you've you moved to that planet. Um, I think that one. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the other one sounds real lonely forever. Yeah. Like, you get to make new friends 15, 1,000 years in the future. But, right. like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I already of, feel like I don't of... know... T- you get to see what the earth is going to be like in a thousand years, right? That's kind of cool. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you're back on earth at the end, but it's not your same earth. Right. What if it's not still, what if there aren't people here when I get back? It could be worse than the planet that you're going to in the other option. So I, I think I would go with your choice as well. Yeah. Great. So maybe not so much of a stumper. Jim, your choices are live for a year on an exoplanet near an M dwarf Mm. or Live for a year on an exoplanet near a stellar black hole, as opposed to a supermassive black hole. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think I have to go with the black hole thing. Even though, even though uh, after this year, do I get to come back and live normally? Because That's, uh, yeah, all that stuff is irrelevant. There's the, whatever whatever the other conditions are are the same between your two choices. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's got to be the black hole just because it's cool. It would be, it would be a, I guess, dark and lonely uh, uh, year, as obviously the uh, bring a light, black hole, <laughs> bring a flashlight. But the uh, the cool spatial effects and stuff that you'd see, the warping of light, the background stuff around the black hole, and all that, it'd be worth the year of darkness uh, to do it. So that would be awesome. Okay. Jim Cooney and the Year of Darkness. Yeah, be an excellent memoir. Now, I mean, since you mentioned coming back, and I wasn't really thinking about this, but if you're very close to that black hole, time is going at a different rate. When you do come back, you may be facing with the same kind of issue that Addie was facing with her other choice. Right. But really, you'd have to be darn close to that black hole. A, a stellar mass black hole, the, the size of the area in which time is running kind of distinctly differently from Newtonian physics is very, very small, and you couldn't really put a planet there. Okay. So I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, good. Good deal. Well, today we have a conversation with Professor Brain. Awesome. 
with is Dr. David Brain, a planetary scientist at the University of Colorado, who will talk to us about Mars and more specifically the Mars Hope mission, uh, where uh, which just one of the three missions that's just arrived at Mars, where he's the deputy science lead, as well as the Mars Maven mission, which has been in orbit around Mars for a few years, and that he is the deputy principal investigator on. So he'll help us understand how studying the weather on Mars can help explain just how things went so wrong on the red planet all those billions of years ago. Uh, but first, this episode... Yeah, those poor little microbes, if they were there. What? Those poor I just said microbes. those poor little microbes, if they were there, they probably got really screwed over by Well, it's not so change. much that I, you know, it's not, yeah, so... Poor microbes, but also it's like the planet. It's just kind of, I mean, everybody loves Mars. We got all these cool missions there. It's very interesting from a scientific standpoint, but from like a vacation spot, it's kind of a dump. Let's be honest. <laughs> There's, you know, no rivers, no lakes, no rain, no clouds, no blue skies, no trees, no gardens, no There's mountains. Life. There are mountains. It's got a little bit of a sort of desert southwest meets Antarctica vibe going yeah, on. It's pretty so, you cool. Know, so, yeah. But I'd rather go to the desert southwest or Antarctica. <laughs> <I> <laughs> Why choose? Uh, uh, but first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Valence Band. Richie Valens was taken from us all too soon on the day the music died, but while the Valence Band died that day, the Valence Band continues to be occupied by electrons, hanging out and doing their quantum electronica dance just below the Fermi level in solids throughout the universe. Whether you're an insulator or a semiconductor, pop into the Valence Band for some rest and respite away from the bumping, bopping, and mayhem in the conduction band. Stay close to your electronic and atomic family by spending time in the Valence Band, where the rhythm is quantum, the beat is electronic, and the moves are out of sight. The Valence Band, the happiest place on Earth. <laughs> I, I, Valence Band has got to be happier than Disney World. I agree. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> well, you correctly identified yeah. the happiest place on Earth is Disney World, and maybe I'm just an old fuddy day. I'd rather go to the to New Mexico than Mars, and I'd rather go to Disney World than the Valence Band. <laughs> I, I would rather be almost anywhere than Disney World, so I think the Valence Band to be awesome. Sounds good. Sounds like a bopping good time. Have you been to Disney World? Oh, I'm sure I've been to Disney World. It's just I, I don't like people. There's so many people. There's a lot of people. Oh. Maybe not right now because we're we're in a pandemic. There's still a lot of there's people. There's still a lot of people there. Disney but, World, yeah. not to just Disneyland. There's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so we're going to be talking in a little bit with uh, Dave Brain about Mars Hope and Mars Maven, but the excitement this week, of course, was the landing of the successful landing of the Mars Perseverance, as I like I to say. I love saying it that way. Contrarian. <laughs> Great. High five. Pronunciation high five. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Perseverance rover. Yeah. I so, debated you know, do, saying it like that on a couple on a, a TV thing I did, but I decided not to. Yeah. Uh, so it, it successfully navigated at seven minutes of terror and has landed in the Yezero crater on yeah. Mars uh, to begin a long mission of exploring and caching samples. Uh, so Krispy we'll have, Kreme had donuts to celebrate. Oh, special Mars person yeah. donuts? Yeah, oh, okay. uh -huh. special Mars yep. donuts. Okay. Uh, so in the months and years to come, uh, we will be having science results from uh, Percy. Uh, but uh, today we're just sort of celebrating its successful arrival. And it had this, this, you know, the seven minutes of terror. It's even more sort of terrifying than I realized the first time around when we did it 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, Except this time there's going to be video. So it's going to take a while to get all the video back. But there's going to be video of that those seven minutes this time. So it's going to be, there's kind of some a, still shots that, released already. Oh, that I'm super excited to see because uh, it's like there's this spacecraft with retro rockets that then lowers the rover down on a crane, the so-called well, sky crane. first it's the parachutes, and then, yeah. And which then which the... actually you could see an image of from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, right? They were flying overhead at the time and yeah. took a picture or a few pictures. So of... that's... that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you could see it. 
Well, also another another um, existing Mars mission that uh, was going to be trying to observe the landing is one you wouldn't necessarily think of is the Mars InSight lander. Yeah. Mm. So it's listening for Mars quakes normally, but Mars quakes are just vibrations on the ground. Um, and one of the big challenges InSight has is that it can detect quakes and potential quakes, um, but because there's only one spot that we're measuring, they don't know the source of those things. So you have to do some clever analysis to try to figure that out. But if there's a landing uh, from, and I think it's they're looking for the landing, not of Percy necessarily, but of the heat shield and a couple of the other things that sort of eject themselves away and will land more thudishly with more mm. of a thump. Uh, they're looking also, for those signals. How far yeah. away is that? That's uh, 3,000 that kilometers. That's that's incredible if you were able to actually detect that. I guess they think they can, right? That's that's right. That blows my so mind. One part of the descent involves these uh, these mass. I'm trying to get the name right here. Oh yeah, these uh, um, cruise mass balance devices, which are just dead weights uh, that get ejected from a pretty high altitude, and they just fall. And Mars's atmosphere is pretty thin, so they're going to hit the ground pretty fast, make a crater several meters across. And because, you know, one of the interesting things for InSight is they've been picking up all these little tiny Mars quakes over the years, but they, um, or I guess it's about a year. Uh, yep. How long has InSight been there? Uh, about a so year. In, any, of it, in any event, it's detecting all these Mars quakes, but doesn't know where they're coming from. So it's very hard for them to sort of figure out what the heck is going on in the interior. But these things, if they can see the signals from them, they know precisely where they've come from, and they know precisely the energy of the thing that caused it. It's like that was yeah. caused by a thing hitting the surface of Mars at exactly this location at exactly this energy, and now yeah. we can see the signal. So that's super valuable um, if they can if they can see those signals. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, one of the big things with Size, seismometers is that like you really want multiple locations that you're measuring um and so because it gives you a way to like triangulate where that signal came from yeah yeah so that's exciting um they they analyzed to see whether or not they'd be able to pick up the sonic boom and determined that they could not uh mm -hmm. that they thought that that would be too weak uh, to hear about so lots of missions at mars which actually is going to be part of our trivia it's a Mars uh, trivia we've got as well. We'll, we'll have uh, Dave Brain uh, join us uh, for the trivia as well. And so uh, let's uh, welcome him onto the show to talk about Mars Hope and Mars Maven. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome to Walk About the Galaxy for the first time. I believe we haven't had you on the show before, Dave. Uh, the planetary scientist with the best name, Professor Brain. <laughs> Yeah, also known for as, yeah <laughs> great to have you here. Uh, Dr. David A. Brain, and I also love that the middle initial is A <laughs> because he's a brain. Uh, so uh, Dave, Professor Brain, is a planetary scientist at the University of Colorado and uh, has many scientific interests, but recently has been doing a lot of work sort of understanding the interface between planets and the space environment, uh, which for Mars means the atmosphere and the top of the atmosphere and that atmosphere has evolved over the ages. And he's uh, the deputy principal investigator on the Mars Maven mission and the deputy science lead on the United Arab Emirates Hope mission, which has recently arrived at Mars. And we should point out that we're recording this just hours after the successful arrival of NASA's Perseverance rover and the surface of Mars. So Dave, great to see you and, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, with that introduction, now you know why I ask most people to call me Dave, because <laughs> my last name Brain is a little too much evil superhero going on there. <laughs> yes. um, for Dr. Brain or Dr. Brain. Cool. Uh, well, Dave, on Walk About the Galaxy, we do some trivia. And uh, I've got some special Mars trivia lined up. I like to he's give gonna, the trivia he's out kick there. Our butts. That's not cool. I'm going to have the trivia percolate in your brains for a little bit. 
uh, and then we'll we'll talk about the science of Maven and and Hope and all these other missions and and what we're learning and hope to learn. Uh, and then we'll come back and I'll get your answers to these uh, questions. So nobody blurt out your guesses yet. I've got three Mars related questions. So okay. we have uh, just had the successful arrival of the third mission at Mars for 2021. There was going to be a fourth, uh, but it was delayed a couple of years. And that's the ESA Russian uh rover that was formerly called ExoMars, and it's been pushed to a 2022 launch and a 2023 arrival. Uh, and that's also going to be looking for signs of past life on Mars. It has a whole bunch of instruments uh, that form a science payload that's called the Pasteur payload, uh, named after Louis Pasteur, who's famous for discovering that it's little microorganisms on the skins of grapes that actually allow, enable you to get wine out of grape juice. If you, you did experiments where you, you sterilized grapes and you don't get no wine, uh, amongst many other life-related discoveries. Um, your question, the first question, is that the ExoMars rover itself has been renamed after another scientist. What notable Nobel Prize-winning discovery broadly related to the goals of this mission, did this scientist contribute to? Bonus, if you know the name of the scientist and then hence the name of the rover. Uh, the other two questions are simpler. Uh, they are, as of today, when we're recording this, after the Mars Perseverance lander landed, how many active missions are there at Mars at the moment? And which decade has seen the most missions launched towards Mars. Okay, so those are going to be your mm. uh, your trivia. Probably not this so, decade. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's okay. not the 2020s. Although the decades start it counting be. it, the decades do start counting at the zeros. So, yeah, yeah, you know, 1940 to 1949, 1950 to 1959, etc. Okay, does that matter? Probably not 1940. <laughs> Uh, does it matter? It, I okay. don't know if it matters or not, actually. I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't go back and look at all those dates. I just uh, know the totals. All right. So let's let's talk about hope. Okay. What is I'm it? ready. Go ahead, Addy. This is, this is actually the <laughs> philosophical podcast. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's something we all should have, but we sent it to Mars. And so... There you go. End of story. Oh. That explains 2020 really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got rid of all our hope. That's right. No, it's um, uh, an orbiting spacecraft mission for Mars. It uh, will study the Martian atmosphere, and it arrived at Mars last week successfully in orbit and returned its very first image of uh, Mars. And it's uh, a mission from the United Arab Emirates, and they have knowledge partners uh, at a few different institutions around the world. And it turns out University of Colorado Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics is one of those partners. So in 2014, they decided let's send a mission to Mars in part for the 50th anniversary of the country. But there are programmatic goals that inspired me to join and I can tell you more about those. So for the past six years, we've been working together to develop this mission and define the science and build the spacecraft and the payload and get it launched in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, that's pretty impressive Ooh. that uh, it's only been six years sort of since the start of all of this. It, yeah, the time, time has gone by very quickly. And you know, this is a country that hasn't sent a mission to another planet before. And yeah. for atmospheric and space physics, it was their first big spacecraft bus. So everybody was in a doing this for the first time kind of situation. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're very happy that we made it successfully to the launch pad and successfully uh, into orbit around Mars. It was a big challenge. So the sort of chassis, the spacecraft bus, as you called it, was for Hope, was built in Colorado at the University of Colorado. Uh, yeah, it was developed. So they're, they're, it's developed in collaboration with a laboratory in the UAE called MBRSC, Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. So it's a joint development 
but the facility where it was put together was in Colorado. And then testing was both in Colorado and the UAE, which was yet another challenge during a pandemic to move a spacecraft and all the people uh, at times when that wasn't allowed and when two-week quarantines were required and keeping I everything bet. on schedule. And then from the UAE to Japan for the launch site. Um, yeah. Before the uh, pandemic, did you get a chance to go over to the UAE a bunch of times because of this? Yeah. So uh, on average, I go twice a year, but I have not been since the pandemic started. Um, hopefully this October, I'll get to go back again. Yeah, but hopefully we can travel. Yeah, that's too bad. I bet you were planning on being there for arrival and all of that. So that's yeah, super the, disappointing. <laughs> very disappointing. There was a huge party in the UAE as it was. They lit up buildings around the country and around the Arab region red. And there were socially distanced masked people at the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. And it was really a big deal there. Yeah. So I was sad not to not to be able to take part you know, in person, but sort of uh, vicariously and virtually. Yeah. And you mentioned that this is the their first um, interplanetary spacecraft. They've had some, they've built some Earth orbiting spacecraft, but this is the first interplanetary mission. That's right. So there have been three previous Earth orbiting spacecraft, and now they're working on CubeSats as well. And for the Earth orbiting uh, spacecraft, they they started with knowledge partners and, and relationships with other laboratories around the world and then have gradually developed capability to be able to do this themselves. And, and this is one of their programmatic objectives is to develop science and engineering capability within their country as they're trying to transition from an oil economy to more of a knowledge-based economy and get young people involved in science, which is not a career path in and of itself, you know, teaching is an absolutely noble profession, but that is the only uh, profession for people who have majored in science in college there uh, before okay. this mission. So, oh wow! So, so what sorts of things in particular is hope hoping to discover about Mars and its atmosphere? Yeah, it's um, you can think of the spacecraft a bit as a weather satellite. That we have previous measurements of the Martian atmosphere, but they're hampered by um, a couple of things. So uh, a lander like Perseverance is going to take really great measurements of the atmosphere at one location at all times of day. But that's like, you know, me going outside here in Colorado and making measurements around the clock and then telling people in Dubai what their weather is going to be like. <laughs> and orbiting spacecraft have the opposite problem. They can measure all over the planet, but the orbit is in a plane. So you're always at one time of day in your orbit, maybe noon, midnight, noon, midnight, noon, midnight. So that's like telling everybody in the world to go outside at noon and make some measurements of the atmosphere and then figuring out what it's going to be like at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. So this spacecraft will um, measure all regions of Mars at all times of day, every nine days on Mars. And so we can figure out how the atmosphere moves, how it fits together. And then also we'll measure the top of the atmosphere, um, hydrogen and oxygen at the top. And the key here is those are things that escape from the atmosphere and have caused changes in climate on Mars. And the hook here for the, the HOPE mission is that um, when we see something change at the bottom of the atmosphere, we can then check to see how the top of the atmosphere responds. And so th these are the science objectives of the mission. I realize if you can see my video, I look like a 1970s album cover right now. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. Got some it's awesome visual, great, visual effects going effect. there. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. so a large part of the um, unique aspect then of this mission, if I understood you right, is that it's not in what's called a sun synchronous orbit where you're sort of in a polar orbit and you're always flying over as you ex gave an example, the no noon on one side, midnight on the other side. So this is in a more uh, sort of equatorial orbit, and that's unusual for, for Mars orbiters? It is unusual for Mars orbiters. I think there's at most one other that's had an equatorial orbit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is near equatorial. And then it's also really large, a very large orbit out near um, the Martian moon Deimos. So that gives us a full global view of the planet for every single observation that we make. So you mentioned nine days. Is that how long it takes Hope to orbit Mars? 
No, uh, the orbit itself is uh, somewhere between 50 and 54 hours, the science orbit, when we finally get into that orbit. Okay. It'll be on the order of uh, 50 hours or so, something like that. But the nine and a quarter days is um, uh, basically we need a certain number of orbits to have visited every geographic region at every time of day. And it turns out the magic number there is about nine and a quarter Mars days. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not too bad. So I cool. had uh, I was under the impression that you know one of the things uh, that this was going to study is like you know obviously Mars has lost a significant fraction of its atmosphere over the past billions of years, and your measurements hope to shed some light on this process. But how do you how do you over the course of a year uh, figure out what's happening over the course of billions of years? That is, you know. Wouldn't you lose so little atmosphere over a year that you couldn't tell anything? Help me. Yeah. I'm dumb. This has been your question for the last like 10 years, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so my hair is turning gray. <laughs> and uh, I could probably measure how much gray has been added to my hair over the course of a single year and use that to predict what my hair might look like 10 years from now. Same general idea for EMM with some added bonus. Um, You know, we're going to examine how the atmosphere changes with season. And the Martian seasons are not symmetric like they are at Earth. You know, summer isn't just as intense as winter in in, uh, each of the hemispheres. So we'll look at seasonal changes and can fold that into our calculations Um, We will look at the influence of dust storms and fold that into our calculations too. things like that. But if I use the hair analogy, uh, you know, coming from my perspective, if you take my hair situation and say, okay, almost completely bald, let's wait, you know, a year and see how much balder I am and then extrapolate back, you would get the wrong answer because you would not from any, any extrapolation of my current situation ever get back to the beautiful, luxurious, wavy locks that used to adorn this head not too long ago. <laughs> I I disagree uh, just with the wording. You said not from any extrapolation. Okay. Not from a Fair simple enough. extrapolation. So if we assume, you know, that my hair or your hair loss is constant in time, we're going to get the wrong answer. And so this is why you take the measurements and you understand the physics you understand what's controlling oh. the changes. <laughs> you know what? I have been leaving that out of so many things. <laughs> Understanding the physics. Damn it. Okay. Right. I got to write a sticky note or something for that. Put it up on my board. <laughs> understand the physics. Okay. There you go. All right. So, yeah, yeah I, I think of it a little bit like, uh, you know, dials on a control panel or knobs on an oven. Or even over the course of a single Martian year, we're going to experience a lot of different combinations of dial settings for the Martian atmosphere. And we can use that to paint a picture of how the atmosphere should respond under any arbitrary combination of dial settings. And then we have to use outside information about how the sun has changed with time, uh, since that's driving atmospheric escape uh, observations that already exist and fold that into the thinking. Well, you mentioned that this is building on, you know, other missions. There have been a bunch of other missions, which we'll at least get to some of those numbers with the trivia. So one of the other missions that you've got a very um, important involvement with is the MAVEN mission, uh, which is an acronym. Unlike HOPE, I think HOPE is HOPE the word, but MAVEN is Mars Atmosphere Volatile Escape or something like that. Uh, What did MAVEN learn about those processes and how is HOPE going to enhance that or or change it great yeah so the acronym for maven is uh you're very close it was mars atmosphere and volatile volatile is just any chemical species that likes to be a gas um so it's kind of saying mars atmosphere and atmosphere so mars, <laughs> mars atmosphere and volatile evolution okay Mm. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, that but the letter oh. at the end is better than a random letter in the middle that, it's least, better than think, in the middle so. that's, that's right um so maven has been studying exclusively uh processes related to the escape of the atmosphere so it's been studying this escape itself 
but it's also been studying the sun and uh, the inputs from the sun that are encountering the atmosphere, both in terms of uh, light from the sun and particles from the sun, magnetic fields that are carried towards Mars, um, and then studying the, the top parts of the atmosphere, basically the part of the swimming pool from which escape could possibly happen on Mars, which not a lot was known about. So it's been orbiting for six years now, since uh, the fall of 2014. Um, so it's been through three Martian years, um, and it's in its fourth mission extension. So it's had its nominal mission, and then it's been extended four times already. Um, and it's yeah, still it's... going great. Yeah, and today it's playing an exciting new role, right? It's, in a, it's, it's a relay satellite for Mars 2020 for Perseverance. That's right. So in addition to the science experiments, the science instruments on MAVEN, of which there are you know, sort of nine to 11, depending upon how we count, um, <laughs> MAVEN also carries a radio that is capable of talking to surface assets. And it's been doing this for a couple of years already uh, with different surface assets. But, um, you know, today is a big day. It was it had to be uh, prepared to support EDL entry, descent and landing for Perseverance, which went very well. So MAVEN does double duty now, along with some of the other um, orbiting missions. There are four total orbiting missions, I think, that uh, carry relays on board to communicate with things on the surface. And MAVEN will so continue like, doing this. Right. So it's like science, 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 science. Oh, hi, Percy. Science, 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 science. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Almost exactly like that. And I'm being serious. <laughs> certain certain fraction of our orbits. Um, relay is the priority. And if we can continue making science or uh, observations while that's happening, fine. But relay is the priority during those orbits. And then the rest of the orbits, we do our science, 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 and then, okay, relay, back right. again. Yeah. Uh, so based on what you've learned so far, if you were going to do a clever extrapolation where you understand the physics, important point, thanks for reminding us about that. Uh, go back how long how long ago did Mars have beautiful, luxurious, flowing waves of hair? I mean, water uh, on the surface. Atmosphere. <laughs> Atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the it works a little bit backwards from that, um, but the, that atmosphere probably existed um, definitely more than three billion years ago, and the atmosphere was probably thick more than four billion years ago. Um, on a four and a half billion year old planet. And this is a little tricky because we don't exactly know the starting time or, or the starting point, but we know from surface features that liquid water was stable on the surface, you know, more than three and a half billion years ago. So we know that starting time. And then with Maven's extrapolations, we can figure out how long it would take um, to lose a really big atmosphere. And we can turn that around and we can start with today and extrapolate back in time and say, how big should the atmosphere have been a long time ago? Um, so there are lots of ifs, ands, or buts in what I sure. just said. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the uncertainties are large, but um, to zeroth order, the answer is Mars lost a lot of atmosphere. <laughs> to first order, it's somewhere between half a bar and one and a half bars. And a bar is, um, Earth's atmosphere is one bar. That's how thick Earth's atmosphere is. Earth's atmosphere is one bar because scientists are lazy. And they said, yeah. how thick is Earth's <laughs> atmosphere? It's one. Right. Yeah. Bar. Yeah. So we, we, yeah. It's not even a clever, like, name. <laughs> yeah. So well, if it's from barometric, right? Of, yeah. Yeah. From barometric. It was just because they were at a bar when they decided what to call it. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah and if we're having beer, then it's actually not exactly one bar even exactly. for Earth's atmosphere. Right, I know. Yeah. Well, that's because we're always tink tinkering with the units. But right. we've had some we've we've had some units trivia on past episodes, and it just kind of turns out that you invent a unit anytime the numbers are getting out of hand, so that the numbers come back down to sort of like around one. So wow. once things get up to like a thousand or down to one thousand, you like make a new unit so that now it's about, you know, a half or one or four of those things or whatever. So it's normal that the atmosphere is one bar. One bar. 
Well, speaking of trivia, then, uh, are you ready to take your your hand or try your try your knowledge uh, on the name, the new name for the ExoMars rover, which is going to be launching next year for arrival in 2023? It is named after a scientist who contributed to a Nobel Prize winning discovery that in you know re- that's relevant to this mission like it's not the nobel peace prize so what was that nobel prize winning discovery bonus if you know who the person is yeah i'm uh actually for me it's the other way around um me too you know the so, person yeah, yeah. it's Ros- rosalind franklin i'm relieved that i know this one uh okay, and yes. it's something biology genetics so i think it's dna, DNA? Jim, any thoughts? Uh, you got you got off easy this time. I did because they just knew the answer. That's good because right. I did not know the answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not being a planetary scientist really killed me in this one. Um, I, I have heard of Rosalind Franklin, and I, I can't remember. She did something with. Well, with I'm I, my hat's DNA. off to you. It, it, it is Rosalind Franklin, as you knew, as you know, and it is uh, uh, the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. She was analyzing and taking these X-ray. Um, crystallography photos, uh, X-ray diffraction images of DNA that led to the discovery of the structure of DNA, for which Crick, Watson, Watson, Watson and, and Crick. Watson and Crick yeah, I thought and, I heard that she really got screwed with not getting a part of that. Uh, so actually, not necessarily. Although you know, it'll be an academic debate about whether she did or not. So the the Nobel Prize was given to Crick Watson and somebody named Maurice Wilkins whose contribution I was not aware of before but she died Rosalind Franklin died at the tender age of 37 4 years before the Nobel Prize was awarded for this and Watson had suggested that she and Wilkins should have shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh you know at that time but while it was not yet a rule the Nobel prize committee wasn't fond of giving posthumous awards. Uh, So she uh, didn't win a Nobel Prize, but uh, has been recognized in many ways, and most recently now with the naming of this rover. Okay, so as of today, with the successful arrival of the Perseverance rover on uh, the surface of Mars, how many active missions are there at Mars? Start with Jim. So I'm going to have to... We're gonna okay, I'm going to have to name them to get a number, so go ahead. You start, uh, you good, start naming them in your head. So uh, I'm going to say there are currently nine. Okay, Jim says nine. Addie, what do you say? I was going to say nine, so I'll say eight. I think I should have okay. gone the other way. I'll say eight, eight should be different from Jim. I think nine is correct, but it could, oh, yeah. I could have missed one. It could be 10. It's three on the That's surface. That's what I was deciding. So insight, um, curiosity, and perseverance on the surface. Orbiting non-US is uh, EMM, hope. Chandrayaan from India and Mars Express. Um, and then from the US, there's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars, uh, uh, Mars Odyssey, Maven, and I can't remember if I'm missing one. If I am, I feel really sad and sorry. You are missing one. There are 10, in fact, but I can't tell you what the name of that 10th one is. Okay. Oh, is it secret? It's not secret, no. I can't tell you out of ignorance, not out of any sort of rule or anything like that. And if you ask this question in like a few weeks, the answer will be different because the Chinese mission is going to separate, right? That's the 10th one. That's Did you count the, the Chinese one. mission? The Chinese mission. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tianwen. Tianwen. There we go. There you go. There you go. And Tianwen is going to separate into a rover, the orbiter. And an orbiter. And so there will be two more, technically. To, so there will be 12. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good point. Yeah. Okay. And then your final question uh, to wrap us up here. Which decade had the most launches of missions towards Mars? And, you know, what the hell? How many? in that decade the 1990s jim says the 90s there were eight there were there were there were five launches in the 90s jim says five launches in the 90s and that's your guess for the most launches in a decade yeah i'm gonna say Addie, the what do you 80s? say 80s Addie says the 80s and how many do you think 70s 
six. Dave, what do you think? Probably the 2000s. One answer, Addy. <laughs> I can't. I'm not good at that. Boy, no Googling. I'm not Googling. Um, There's a lot writing the brain. on this, so I'm glad you're taking your time. I'll say, <laughs> I'll say the aughts. The aughts. Yeah. Well, uh, you, all three of you, as I, were fooled. This is the 60s. The night, it was the 60s. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, he knew it. 13 oh. missions. 13 missions were launched to Mars in the 60s. The second most was in the 70s with 11. Uh, no other decade had more than 10. And in fact, the 80s was the lowest since we started doing it with only two missions launched to Mars in the 80s. That was the uh, like, yeah. after effect right there. Is yeah, the, I was trying to remember which decade was the, the lag one, but I, yeah, I, I yeah. was off. Uh, the 2010s had six that the previous decade so far, and the 2020s were at three, uh, with at least one we know of coming up at the next launch opportunity. These opportunities come up approximately every two years. So. And okay. the Japanese have one in the works, maybe two in the works even for the Japanese. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Dave, thanks so much for joining us on Walk About the Galaxy. We're going to ask you back at some point after uh, Hope has had several of these uh, nine-day uh, opportunities to study uh, Mars's atmosphere, and you can tell us what new things and exciting things we've learned from Mars as well as MAVEN. Uh, so we'll check in with you again. Great. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Happy to come back. While it may have felt like the time since Mars was last wet and warm, it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Take a hot shower, speaking of wet and warm, and write us a review in the condensed water on your mirror and TikTok it, or whatever you do. Scary <laughs> horror movie lines. style? Do those tiktok -y things. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates. Our updates? <laughs> and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see most of our episodes, some of our bloopers, and all of our music videos. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag AskWTG. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jurisic. Thanks to our listeners on Mars missions and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Danny DeVito. What happened to Paul Giamatti? <laughs> he got replaced mid-season replacement <laughs> we're the Astrocork signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy go Percy